We are through two weeks of Legacy Leagues action for the Summer 21 season in Rhode Island. And there are four undefeated teams, two of which a lot of us probably expected coming into the season, and two of which I know a lot of us probably did not. And so we're going to break down all the week two action. We're joined by Steven and Matt here, who are going to help us break down the games. We'll get to those guys in a second. But first, week two also featured the uh, very highly anticipated matchup between the Duyez boys and Lob City. And that wasn't even one of our closest games from the week. Uh, it ended up being a big Duyez boys win by 20 points. We're going to go to Matt over on court one first, who saw that game. But Matt, what was the, you know, what were the Duyez boys able to do uh, to stifle Lob City? And I know Lob City was missing some of its key players, but you know, let's focus on the Duyez boys and uh, you know, what did they do well? Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, uh, two really good teams going at it. I think we expected obviously a closer game. Lob City had a good win last week, but I think what the du the Duyez boys did well was the in the intensity of the game, the passion, they got in the head of the Lob City boys pretty quickly. Uh, when they were hitting threes, you know, fast breaks, blocks, they were screaming, they were yelling. Uh, they made a crowd when there wasn't really a huge crowd. Uh, they had the six man on their back. And I just felt like they got in the head of Lob City. Um, they, Lob City didn't have enough consistent offense. They were turning it over. They were getting frustrated. One player got ejected. Uh, the Duye boys, they kept it controlled to not get too many fouls and, you know, get in trouble with the refs, but they had a lot of passion, just too much energy where mentally it was hard to go up against them. Yeah. And I just want to touch on really quick, you know, for Lob City, no um, Victor Cashew Jr. And uh, no Jose Mercado either. So two of their, you know, more important players, especially in a big game like this, were absent from the court. Uh, we can wrap back around on them. I mean, you, you broke it down very well. So we're going to keep it moving. Uh, speaking, you know, and keeping to the theme of the undefeated teams, the Duyez boys do improve to 2-0 and after that win. And so let's get to one of those teams that maybe surprise a lot of people getting to 2-0. and Let's touch on the Orcas, who took down the halfway crooks in a battle of 1-0 and teams coming in. But it was the Orcas with a big win. Had some key words for a Christian Martinelli from the podcast after the game, which was very funny, saying that he knew better than to set a 10-point spread against them, which was super funny. Check out that interview on Facebook if you haven't yet. Steven, um, you know, you were there for that game uh, for Orcas and Halfway Crooks. Again, Orcas 2-0, and one of, or, yeah, one of our four remaining unbeaten. But what did the Orcas do well in that game to uh, take care of a Halfway Crooks team that a lot of people picked to win that game? I believe the Orcas used a lot of their size. They used a lot of their big men down low. They out-rebounded the uh, halfway crooks, and that's how they won. The big, big, big scores in the paint. Uh, yeah, a lot of rebounding, and dish, they dished out. They dished out a lot of passes for the for threes, and yeah, that's all they won. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they started off super hot. The uh, Orcas seemed not to miss again. You know, against my team, and it seemed like they just wanted it more too. You know, we touch on Jeff Winchell, twenty points on nine of twelve, and. Yeah, he had a three as well. So his two misses were from three. Two of his three misses were from three. So there you go. So nearly perfect on his field goals from two-point range. And, you know, he's a big body in this league for sure. And he plays like it. And so he took care of business down low. And, you know, Kendall Gillian's added 14. As far as the crooks, they shot 46% to, you know, the Orcas 56%. Four of 14 from three for the crooks, which is not going to get it done, especially not in the legacy leagues with the type of shooters. Um, that, you know, a lot of the uh, teams have in this league. Steven, let's stay on the Orcas a little bit. Was that your first time seeing them? Yes, that was my first time seeing All the right. Orcas. So what did, what did you think compared to some other teams that you've seen? What did you, you think about them? Uh, they play a lot of team ball. Like, everybody on their team could score. Everybody on their team plays defense. They're a great team, and I believe they'll go far this year. All right, and I'm just trying to get – uh, Kyle Finn in here. So that's going to be awesome if he can join mid show. Um, give me one second, but moving on to the next, you know, game and matchup here in week two. So we have the Orcas two and zero. we touched on the Duyez boys two and zero. let's get to good. You another one of those two and O teams. And they had a very big matchup again on court one with the werewolves. And so, you know, they, they were in control. It seemed like Matt and then the werewolves made it interesting. I believe in the third, they cut it to definitely single digits, five or six or seven points. Um, and then, you know, good. You did end up winning by 14 um, after, you know, playing them even in the second half, which is pretty, 
pretty impressive. Um, so it was a, you know, first, first half that allowed good you to pull away and get the win, but what'd you see from good you, Matt, that, uh, you know, against another really good team in the werewolves, how are they able to get the win? Yeah, the werewolves, um, definitely. I did them a little dirty on the power rankings going into week two, because I don't think they were in the top half, but they definitely played like one, you know, they played intense and good. You is a good team, a lot of talent. They were also missing uh, some guys, but again, that seemed like a game where the werewolves were making those runs in the third quarter, like you mentioned, but it did just seem like good. You had it in control. It was led by um, um, Butler who mm-hmm. he, the way they were working in those like uh, five minute shifts, every time he came in, that's when good. You got their lead back. He wasn't missing from three. He had over 20 points, huge body, dominant inside. Um, so I think good you again, for a reason why teams are going to be successful in this league is the depth because, you know, it's only 4v4 and players are going to get tired. So if you can get four or three guys in there off the bench that don't decrease the quality that much, you're going to succeed. And I just think the werewolves were relying too much on a couple players to make that miracle comeback when the good you, they had five or six guys that could put up 10 plus. So that's what got them to win, just being deep and being consistent. Yeah. And look at this timing for Kyle. So we're talking about good you and the werewolves. He joins the post game show. I love it, but you know, you can touch on the werewolves matches broke down, you know, Randy Butler and his performance for good you Kyle, but you know, even like the werewolves, we talked about them making it close, right? Um, I think at some points in the third quarter, cutting it to single digits, how were they able to nearly come back? And what were they doing during those stretches that they were unable to do throughout the entire game? Uh, a lot of things that I noticed with the Werewolves is that they were doing a tactic where they were fouling uh, good you to slow them down, taking advantage of having no shot clock, um, making the, uh, the good you team. Uh, inbound the ball and having to reset that really disrupted good use tempo because they really saw how last game they were just able to grab the rebound and throw it up core and they would just have a two on one every time the world was really just uh, slowed that down by just simply fouling and take advantage of that yeah and so you know the werewolves a team they even tweeted out uh, after the game that you know they'll be back you know we'll see more of them and we definitely will they're a strong team they had a tough tough early schedule with the Juillet's boys and then good you. So, um, you know, they played two of the undefeated teams right off the bat. Let's save that fourth undefeated team, which is one of our surprise teams for later. Let's go back to, I believe it was the closest margin of any game in week two, the stampede in Sin City. And it is Sin City able to get the win, uh, 79-71 led by Yariel Rodriguez, who had a, a huge game. Uh, and he, he had 12 made threes, I believe. Steven, what was Sin City able to do um, to get their first win on the season? I believe Sin City relies a lot on the leading scorer in the league and his partner in crime. Uh, they're a very undersized team. I believe they're very they're strong on offense, but they do like defense, and they rely on offense 100% to win this game. Yeah, and so what about the Stampede? You know, I know they made it close, but what did you see from them? Uh, they're like the, they're a very good uh, team. They play as a team, a lot of chemistry, but they couldn't stop. They couldn't stop or outscore Sin City, and that's why they lost this game. Even though it was a close game, I believe they would come. I believe that they could have came back, but they couldn't stop Sin, Sin City on offense, and that's what. It, yeah, they were like matching buckets down the stretch for sure trying to come back uh, the Stampede in Sin City, but just unable to get a stop and uh, complete the comeback for the Stampede. Let's now reveal that fourth and final undefeated team. So just to recap, good you, Duye's boys, the Orcas. And now we got to touch on the Ozone boys who surprised a lot of people in summer 2019. And I was one of their critics early on who was like, they're good, but they haven't played anybody. They're good, but they haven't played anybody. And then they played some teams and they were still very good. And I believe they were a four or five seed and made a run in those playoffs. And they were pointing at me the whole time, like, we told you, we told you. Well, they took care of business in week two, improving to 2-0, and oh, taking care of ball, don't lie. Um, they jumped out, I believe it was like 22-4 to four after the first quarter and then never really looked back. 77-49 for the Ozone boys. We can go back to Matt. Uh, I'm not sure if that was your first time seeing them, but an impressive performance from the Ozone boys for sure. Yeah, no, I saw the Ozone Boys week one as well. They were over on uh, court three when they defeated the Mambas. But the Ozone Boys, they might be my favorite team to, to watch. 
um, you know, all, you know, college age level kids. And the thing with them is their athleticism and their energy. I mean, they're just running up and down the court nonstop, alley-ooping, throwing dunks, blocks. It's just good fun. You know, they're out there just to have a good time. And it almost just seems like it's a competition to get, like, you know, the best block or the coolest dunk or something like that. But overall, they can definitely lock down and play good team basketball. They have, I think, in the last two games, these first two games, I should say, they've had at least four guys each game to get 12 or more. Like, the, between the Hogan brothers, uh Zach Brooks and Paul McGuire, they spread the ball, you know, pretty evenly. They don't really care about who gets the points because end of the day, they're having fun and, you know, they're getting big wins this year so far. I don't, I, I don't think the Mambas and the, you know, ball don't lie has been adequate competition for them, but once they get play some really good teams, again, we'll see, we'll see if they're really up for the challenge against those other undefeated teams in the league, but they're an exciting team for sure. Before we go to Kyle, it sounds like Matt is pulling a me from last year. Be careful. They don't forget. They don't yeah. forget about their competition level. But I do want to shout out Grant Rosenberg from Ball Don't Lie. Two strong games from him, uh, for sure. 24 points and just a rough shooting night for that team overall. But you touched on, you know, the Hogan brothers. And we got to mention Eric Eason, who had 12. And, you know, they had, again, five players with nine or more points in week two, which is big for the Ozone boys. Kyle, on them really quick, because they are one of our four undefeated teams. You know, where do they stack up in the league and what'd you see from them in week two? Oh, I have a lot to talk about with the Ozone boys. <laughs> One of the biggest things that I like about this team is that they're all friends. They used to play high school together uh, from Cranston East. So they already have that chemistry like pat down. Uh, this team, oh boy, I can't wait to see this team go up against like the um, Duguay boys and uh, Lob City because uh, they're going to make a lot of noise this year. I'm, and they're very happy that... Uh, I don't want to say anything though, but uh, they're moving up my power ranking. They're, they're moving <laughs> up a lot, and uh, I promised them that they would be pretty high. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure they need to keep performing like this though in order to stay high on my list. That's right. And uh, so two different approaches taken by Matt and Kyle. Matt is giving them the you got to play somebody first, and Kyle's like I don't give a crap. I don't care who you played. You're high in the rankings because I told you. So it's all good. It's all good. They are hey. They don't get to pick the schedule, 2-0. and oh. All they can do is win their games. I'm with you guys. Uh, speaking of getting a win, Rhode Island Warriors for our last game, take down the Mambas, 88-76. And, uh, yeah, Rhode Island Warriors getting that first win on the season. So they improved to 1-1. One and one. You know, Kevin Figueroa, I believe, made his debut. Another big body, 36-11 and 11 for him. And Charles Perea, 30 points as well, leading the Warriors. You know, two players combining for 66 points. Stephen, what'd you see from the Warriors, you know, as they get their first win? Yeah, like you said, they relied on those two players heavily to to receive that win, and they definitely played good defense down the stretch. Yeah, for sure. Holding the uh, Mambas to 43% from the floor and 37% from three. Uh, how do you think the Warriors stack up against some of the, the other teams you've seen, Stephen? I believe uh, as of now, they have they're they're one of the better teams in the uh, in the league, but they have a lot to do to uh, compare to teams like uh, Sin City and uh, the Dewey Boys. Yeah, for sure. And so they're one and one. And so just to kind of do a little standings recap, we talked about the four undefeated teams. We then have four teams at one and one: the Warriors, Lob City, Halfway Crooks, and Sin City. And four teams at zero and two: the Stampede Werewolves, Ball Don't Lie, and the Mambas. So let's do this. We're going to go around. We've already touched on, you know, the four undefeated teams, and I think we covered them a lot. Let's focus on that group of one-in-one teams. So we have the Warriors, Lob City, Halfway Crooks, and Sin City. We can go – we'll go to – we'll make – we'll put Kyle on the spot. We'll go to Kyle first. Which of those one-in-one teams do you think can most likely upset one of the undefeated teams? And I think, you know, a pretty clear answer is Lob City, so maybe I'll make you pick someone other than Lob City. But – you know, what one and one team do you think is the most dangerous come playoff time? Yeah, you are right. I was going to say um, Lob City, but I think the RI Warriors can do it. Uh, it's just it's just getting used to being back in the season, getting the chemistry going together. Um, and it may take an off night from one of the undefeated teams. It's, it's simple as that. I, I think um, 
Uh, I don't know when they're playing the Orcas this, uh, but I think they have a good chance of doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's well, a little bit later in the season, but uh, yeah, if the Orcas stay undefeated, I, I think they could do it. Simple as that. They, they can easily take down that undefeated team, but they also can do it with good you as well. Yeah. I'm going to throw it to Steven. I'm going to put Matt on the spot with a different question, but Steven, which of those one and one teams uh, do you like the best? Lob City, Halfway Crook, Sin City, or the Warriors? Um, uh, definitely uh, the Warriors. They're a great all-around team, and they can shoot. They play defense, so, yeah, that's my pick. Let me do this really quick before we get to Matt. Uh, Lob City in week three plays the Ozone Boys, so that's going to be an awesome game. Yes. Good I game. feel bad for the Ozone Boys because you guys just trashed Lob City, and they listen. And so what's going to happen is they're going to take it out on the Ozone Boys, I promise. So hey, I, I, I didn't trash Lob City. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> say anything. clearing his name. He's, no, I know. And you guys would have picked Lob City as the one-on-one team that can do the most damage. We're with you. We're not trashing anybody. But it's just funny. We focused on the Warriors with that question. Matt, we can go back to those undefeated teams really quick. Um, I know you already know the list. You've been here the whole time. Kind of touched on the Ozone Boys a lot, but which one, you know, if you had to pick two of those four undefeated teams to make the finals, let's say, you know, which which two do you think are the strongest right now? Um, I would say the Douye Boys uh, for sure. They got the depth. Um, again, I think what's going to be so important in this league is the passion and the energy because some of these guys, they can get – you can easily get in their head mentally. And I think the Douye Boys, and we know who they are, they got some guys on that team that will yell, they'll scream they'll be getting feisty. So I definitely think them. And honestly, I'm going to say the Ozone Boys would be one. And I, I think my reasoning for that is their athleticism and just how in shape they are. I mean, these guys are young. They can run up and down the court. That's going to tire out some teams. And again, they have depth. They go, they split the quarters evenly. They got four in, four out. And it's just, you don't, you don't really see a change in quality. So I think with the athleticism and the depth, I think, again, a young team, I think they can, you know, shock some people for sure. Good U is a good team, but I would take those other two above them. And I'm sure Good U will have something to say next week when they take on the Rhode Island Warriors looking to make a statement. And then in week four, we do get Good U in Lob City. So we're going to find out a lot about those teams we talked about tonight, starting in week three. Guys, thank you very much. Great job. And uh, stay tuned for the podcast, which will be coming up, and they'll be breaking down more games as well as previewing those week three games. We'll have our rankings, top plays, and more throughout the week. Again, guys, thank you, and thanks for watching. Thank you. No problem.